This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles. Right now, for a limited time, you guys can get 25% off the cost of a subscription. More about them in a bit. It's one of the most evocative names in all of history. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon is a phrase that conjures instant images of vast tiers of marble draped in exotic plants rising high into the sky. Supposedly built by the great king Nebuchadnezzar II, they've graced the human imagination for centuries, a feat of engineering that projected Babylonian might across the ancient world. Featured on Philo of Byzantium's famous list of seven wonders, the Hanging Gardens are up there with the pyramids or the Colossus of Rhodes in terms of achievement. There's just one little problem. We've no idea if they actually ever existed. Lost way before the beginning of our common era, the Hanging Gardens have drifted today into the world of myth and legend. Unlike the Six Other Wonders, no archaeological evidence or contemporary documentation has ever been found. So why should that be, and what might it mean? In today's Geographics, we're exploring the mystery of the ancient world's missing wonder. It's a question that's dogged tourists since time immemorial. How do I know where to take my stupid selfies? Today, most of us rely on stuff like Instagram and YouTube travel shows to make the choice for us. But back in the ancient worlds, they had something a little bit different. If you were wondering where to drag your betogod family to, you might have a checklist of themata. Translated as things to be seen, themata were places grouped together by different writers with different interests. Most famously, around 225 BC, Philo of Byzantium, or someone claiming to be him at least, produced a list of seven. Today, these are known as the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. Now, Philo wasn't the first one to write a list of wonders, nor were his chosen seven the only game in town. Other famous writers to tackle the themata included the epigrammist Antipater, while well, some versions included lesser well-known sites like the Walls of Babylon. But it's Philo's list that eventually became canonical, giving us the seven classical wonders that we know today. Of them, the most famous is the only one that's still standing, the Great Pyramid of Giza. After that, there's another five, which likewise lay around the Mediterranean, the Temple of Artemis, the Statue of Zeus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Lighthouse at Alexandria, and the Mausoleum at Halicarnassus. But there was one entry off the beaten track, one that lay not in the comfortable Hellenist sphere, but way out on the eastern fringes of the world near the Euphrates. It was out here, in the storied city of Babylon, that the Hanging Gardens could be found. Although Babylon had stood for centuries, it really exploded into the Greek consciousness around 331 BC. That was the year that Alexander the Great conquered the city, dying there just eight years later. While Alexander's death would see his empire shatter into warring fragments, by the time of Philo, Babylon was firmly in the grasp of the Seleucid Empire. Hellenistic in nature, the Seleucids were friendly enough to let travelers in, yet also remote enough to seem impossibly exotic. In fact, they were so remote that it seems Philo never actually traveled there. Instead, his inclusion of the gardens, like others who wrote later lists, was probably based on written accounts, few of which survive today. Alexander the Great's biographer, Cletarchus, for example, gave one of the first descriptions in the 4th century BC. A hundred years later, the Babylonian priest Barossas fleshed things out further. Philo's readers then weren't getting first-hand knowledge of this particular wonder. Well, so what? You might be thinking, 80% of travel listicle writers have probably never left their basements, let alone gone to all the places that they're banging on about. The difference is that today it's pretty easy for you to just jump online and confirm both what the Eiffel Tower looks like and where it actually exists. By contrast, centuries of searching in the modern era have uncovered no ruins of the Hanging Gardens or even confirmed accounts of anyone seeing them firsthand. Among the Seven Wonders, this is unique and it begs a rather interesting question. Where the hell are they? Depending on which version you believe, the tale of the Hanging Gardens construction comes with varying degrees of plausibility. Some Greeks refer to them as the Hanging Gardens of Semiramis, reflecting the belief that they were created by the 9th century BC queen of the same name. But since Semiramis is a semi-mythological figure, it seems more likely that people just attributed stuff to her in the same way we attribute any old witty quote to Oscar Wilde. The much more common story of the gardens involves a historical personality who we know a lot more about, and that 
is Nebuchadnezzar II. The longest lived and greatest of the Neo Babylonian kings, Nebuchadnezzar was born in 630 BC to a general in the Neo Assyrian Empire. Once an independent city state, Babylon had by this stage been absorbed by the Neo Assyrians. Keeping it that way was the job of Nebuchadnezzar's dad, Nabopolassar. At least that's how his employers understood it. But when the Assyrian emperor kicked the bucket, Nabopolassar uncrossed his fingers and declared himself the king of Babylon. The subsequent war saw the Neo Assyrians smashed and the Neo Babylonian Empire rise up in their place. But Nebuchadnezzar barely got a chance to enjoy his shiny new toy before dying in 605 BC, passing Babylon on to his son. And that son was all about mad building projects. During his long reign, Nebuchadnezzar II would build the fabled Gate of Ishtar, the walls of Babylon, an engineering feat so impressive it made some versions of the Seven Wonders list. But it was Nebuchadnezzar's most romantic construction project that would become his most famous of all. The story, as it's most commonly told, goes that Nebuchadnezzar was married to the Median princess Amethyst. Dispatched from her forested mountain home to the flat, dusty plains of modern Iraq, Amethyst soon began to miss things like trees and the shade and the color green. So Nebuchadnezzar decided to build Amethyst a home away from home, a vast artificial mountain covered in plants, trees, and grasses from media. He would call this engineering miracle the Hanging Gardens. Although the tale sometimes makes out like Nebuchadnezzar was the first person to attempt anything like this, the reality is that Grand Gardens had existed long before the neo babylonians The idea is thought to have first appeared in the Fertile Crescent, a swath of verdant land in Mesopotamia today considered one of the cradles of civilization. Known as paradises, these gardens slowly crept out of the east and into the Hellenistic world. Originally, they were grand affairs owned by kings and filled with artificial water features, statues, and sculptures. By Philo's time, though, they'd become a lot more domestic. Although still the preserve of the wealthy, gardens were now owned by private citizens. And for the ancient world's not quite so rich classes, that made them aspirational possessions. In some places, the insides of villas would be decorated on one wall with a giant fresco mimicking a garden so people could look at it and pretend their home opened into a little slice of paradise. For ancient readers, then, the idea of the hanging gardens was like a vision of something they loved turned all the way up to 11. Perhaps it's no surprise that it made it onto the canonical list of wonders. That's especially true when you realize what they must have looked like. Although no single definitive description of the Hanging Gardens has survived to today, we do have scattered versions from different authors, but all agree on one salient point. Whatever the truth of their construction, Babylon's gardens were awesome. When kids first hear about the Hanging Gardens, the obvious question is, hanging, what does it mean? The thing is, no one actually knows. That's because the published description's enough that it could mean one of many things. Philo's description of the gardens, for example, suggests that they really did hang. In his telling, Babylon's great gardens were raised up on stone columns, across which a whole load of palm branches were laid and reinforced with reeds. These reeds were then covered in soil, and this soil planted with trees and flowers that grew directly above the heads of visitors. For this version of the gardens, the wondrous part was the sheer variety of plant life hanging over the edges for all to see. The irrigation system, by contrast, was relatively simple. Philo wrote of water collected on high in numerous ample containers, suggesting the whole thing was kept alive by rainfall. At this point, you may be hearing some alarm bells in the rational part of your brain. The area of Mesopotamia Babylon stood in isn't exactly known for its heavy rainfall. It's certainly not wet enough to capture and store enough water to keep a massive garden alive. What it is known for, though, is its position right alongside the Euphrates River, which may be why Diodorus's account includes no mention of water being collected on high. Instead, the first century BC historian wrote of machines raising the water in great abundance from the river, like a complex set of Archimedes screws that actually predated Archimedes. Nor was it only in water harvesting that Diodorus's version differed from Philo's. While Philo's hanging gardens were basically a fancy trellis, Diodorus's were a pyramid rising in tiers to a height of 20 meters or 65 foot in old money. Rather than being simple soil laid on reeds, each level was reinforced by brick and lead to stop the moisture escaping. Giant stone hallways allowed people to walk among the plants in the shade, enjoying a view across Babylon as they did so. Meanwhile, the Archimedes screws were hidden in the walls, giving a sense of serene impossibility to the whole place. It's a breathtaking description and one that still powers most images of the Hanging Gardens today. But it's worth pointing out that Diodorus's 
Pandorus also never visited Babylon. Like Philo, he was working from other sources. The same goes for all the other writers who tried to describe the seventh wonder. In the first century AD, the geographer Strabo wrote his own accounts, mentioning machines to raise river water and sweeping stairways leading up, but he mostly seems to have been drawing on Diodorus. Josephus likewise mentions the garden, stating that they were located in the main palace, but there's no evidence that he visited them either. In fact, pretty much all exact accounts of the gardens run into this same basic problem. As far as we can tell, none of the surviving descriptions were written by people who'd actually been to Babylon. We don't even know what precise era the gardens may have existed in. Even if someone like Diodorus had gone to the trouble of hauling his ass east to check them out, there's no guarantee they'd have still been standing. And it's at this point that our video is going to get a little bit wild. If no one actually saw the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, what did they really exist? And what a cliffhanger that is, and we'll be returning to it in just a moment. But first, a quick word from today's excellent sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Think of it as the Netflix for nerds, the Hulu for history buffs. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms and web app Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. If you've got a device with a screen, you're probably going to be able to watch it. It's offered worldwide and it's constantly updated with amazing timely content. For example, if you're looking forward to Shark Week, and why wouldn't you be, then you might want to take a look at The Secret Lives of Sharks, which was just added last month. Now, if you're enjoying this episode of Geographic centered around the Hanging Gardens, why not check out Curiosity Stream's 10 episode series, Ancient Engineering? If you're looking for more content on these seven ancient wonders of the world, then you can't go wrong with that. You could go to curiositystream.com forward slash geographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series and right now for you guys just use the promo code geographics and you'll save 25 percent off the cost of an annual membership fantastic makes it what 14 dollars 99 cents a year amazing click the link below or just go to curiositystream.com forward slash geographics and let's get back to it The first major issue with the tale of the Hanging Gardens is that there are no contemporary Babylonian sources that mention their existence. Nebuchadnezzar II was a king who liked to boast. We have comprehensive brags carved in stone listing everything he ever achieved, from big-ass stuff like the Gate of Ishtar to little-ass stuff like naming the streets of Babylon. Basically, he was the sort of king who'd get his scribes to write a poem celebrating him taking an incredible sh** yet somehow he forgot to mention those world famous gardens that he built which doesn't really make a lot of sense likewise writers after nebuchadnezzar's time are conspicuously silent about the gardens at an engineering marvel once stood in babylon you'd think it'd be mentioned even in a ruined state but neither the neo babylonians or scribes from the subsequent achaemenid or seleucid empires ever write about the elevated gardens the second major problem is that we can't trust the hellenistic sources that do mention them nebuchadnezzar ii died in 562 bc when herodotus came to write about babylon in his history is the best part of a century later, he never once mentioned the Hanging Gardens. It's not until you reach the 4th century BC that people begin referencing spectacular gardens in the city, and even those writings no longer survive. The first unequivocal mention of the Hanging Gardens in an ancient source only arrives in the 3rd century with Barossus of Kos, a Babylonian priest who spent most of his life, as his name would imply, living on the island of Kos. Barossus was working a bit less than 300 years after Nebuchadnezzar's death. To put that in perspective, traveling back in time 300 years would land you in George Washington's childhood. He was in no way a contemporary source. He also got quite a lot wrong. Remember that tale of Amatis, the homesick princess Nebuchadnezzar built his gardens for? Well, it turns out no Amatis or Median princess appears in any of those extremely detailed Babylonian records either. She only exists in stories of the Hanging Gardens. Nor was Barossus the only one to make major mistakes. In the same text he talks about the gardens, Diodorus also talks about the walls of Babylon, describing in great engraved detail scenes of royalty hunting leopards. As you could probably guess, there's no other evidence pictures of leopard hunting ever appeared on Babylon's walls. The last nail in the coffin of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon comes from much closer to our own time. In the early 21st century, Dr. Stephanie Daly of Oxford University did a detailed study of Babylon's topography and concluded that no matter how many fancy screws Nebuchadnezzar had, getting enough water out of the river up into the air to nourish an entire garden would have just been impossible. So, well, 
I guess that's it then. Is it proof that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon never existed and all those theme writers were basically the ancient versions of the chumps back in 2003 who fell for the bonsai kittens? Well, not exactly. See, the non-existence theory also has a lot of holes in it, a major one being that the Greeks could travel to the Seleucid Empire, meaning someone would have eventually reported back on all the confused Babylonians being like, Gardens? Nah, never heard of them, mate. That leaves two possibilities. Well, three if you include aliens did it. Proof of extraterrestrial intervention. So, two possibilities. One, the garden did exist, but on a much smaller scale than we've been led to believe. Their size and grandeur exaggerated with each retelling until they became semi-legendary. Or two, the hanging gardens really were as spectacular as we've heard, but they were not in Babylon. Before we start digging into where the gardens may have been, we should probably talk about attempts to find them. That's because archaeology has a track record of digging up some random bricks in the Iraqi desert and bellowing, Behold! I have found the gardens! when they hadn't. The first person to do this was Robert Cold Dewey, who gets a massive pass for also being the first archaeologist who actually examined the ruins of Babylon. Born on September 10, 1855, in what is now Germany, Cold Dewey grew up in an era in which Babylon's existence was disputed. Disputed. Although it was widely referenced in ancient works and the Bible, there was no pile of identifiable ruins someone could point to and say, that, that is Babylon, right there. Caldue would change all of that. After initially working as an archaeologist in modern-day Turkey, he abruptly switched his focus to southern Iraq in 1897, specifically to a site theorized to be the location of Babylon. There, over a period of 15 years, 18 years in some tellings, he uncovered treasures the likes of which the world had never seen. It was Koldui's team who uncovered the Ishtar Gate, the foundation to the great ziggurat dedicated to Marduk. For the first time, humans could see and understand the geographical reality of this biblical city. Then Koldui's team even topped that by managing to find the Hanging Gardens. When Koldui uncovered the arched structure built of water-resistant carved stone dotted with deep wells and situated right next to the palace, he basically bellowed something really loud in German about discovering the Hanging Gardens. Sadly, later digs would uncover cuneiform tablets in these gardens inscribed with amounts of stuff like grain and oil. As a result, modern scholarship now thinks this was probably just a warehouse. <laughs> Disappointing. Next up was the British archaeologist Leonard Woolley. Like Cal Dewey, Woolley also gets a life pass thanks to his real discoveries. Born in London in 1880, he led some majorly significant excavations at the Sumerian city of Ur. But he also had his own behold moments when he dug up the ruins of a ziggurat. The bricks used in the ziggurat's construction were all bored with holes. While Woolley initially thought this was to help with drying, he soon changed his mind and decided they were evidence of a drainage system, the sort of system that, you guessed it, could have supported the fabled hanging gardens. Or could it? Later analysis suggested that this would have left the building dangerously unsound and prone to collapse. And the collapsing gardens of Babylon just doesn't really have the same ring to it, does it? There have been other claims too, some far less outlandish. Remains of an irrigation system and a possible reservoir were uncovered near the palace, leading to renewed speculation that the gardens were as tangible as the pyramids. Yet, despite well over a century of interest, the archaeological smoking gun has never been found. At least, not at Babylon. Less than ten years ago, a new theory started making the rounds, one heavily backed by a wealth of evidence. What if the seventh wonder of the world wasn't really at Babylon, but Nineveh? Dr. Stephanie Daly is someone with an interesting claim to fame. She may be the person who finally discovered the location of the missing gardens of Babylon. In 2013, after nearly two decades of intense research, the Oxford University professor published a book in which she laid out evidence that the gardens were attributed to the wrong city. The results were somewhere between convincing and, well, goddamn mind-blowing. Nineveh was the one-time capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the guys who ruled Babylon before Nebuchadnezzar's dad revolted and kicked them out. Almost exactly a century before Nebuchadnezzar's reign, that capital was home to one of ancient Mesopotamia's greatest kings, Sennacherib. Here's where it gets interesting. Sennacherib was like Nebuchadnezzar, a prodigious boaster, but he was also a great engineer. While Nebuchadnezzar's archives are full of him bragging about building giant walls, Sennacherib's are filled with boasts about aqueducts, and 
clever irrigation systems. One such aqueduct was built from two million bricks and brought water right across the Jowan Valley. There's even evidence that Sennacherib may have invented the Archimedes screw, in other words, the exact mechanical device you need if you want to transfer water up into some terrace gardens. But the real kicker comes in the annals of Sennacherib's reign. In particular, one where he declares, I raised the height of the surroundings of the palace to be a wonder for all peoples, a high garden imitating the Amanus Mountains I laid out next to it with all kinds of aromatic plants. If you think that sounds a little like the Hanging Gardens, well, you are not alone. Dr. Daly also zeroed in on this. Nor does her evidence stop there. There's the sketch of a now lost bas relief from Nineveh, which showed trees growing atop a roof held up by several stone pillars. There's the later relief, still extinct, showing Sennacherib's grandson among what appears to be a mountain of trees rising in tears. And then there's the circumstantial proof. In 698 BC, Sennacherib's army attacked Babylon. Although his men sacked the city, the king himself evidently liked what he saw. When he returned to Nineveh, he renamed places and streets after locations in Babylon and started using the names of the Babylonian gods. Dr. Daly has found evidence that Nineveh itself started to be called Babylon in this time, a name that may have stuck to it even as the real Babylon returned to power. In other words, those who originally wrote of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon may have meant an entirely different Babylon, one that we know as Nineveh. Lastly, there's the matter of the original Hellenistic sources. Remember way back in chapter 1 when we said how the first and now lost accounts of the gardens came from dudes like Alexander's biographer Cleotarchus? Well, Alexander and his men camped right near Nineveh in 331 BC, just before a major battle. It's possible they saw Sennacherib's still surviving gardens and carried the knowledge of them back to the Hellenistic world. If this theory is true, then the most mysterious wonder of the ancient world has been hiding under our noses this whole time. Somewhere in the ruins of Nineveh, we may yet find the last traces of the gravity-defying garden that wowed the ancient Greeks, the hanging gardens of Nineveh. We can't say for certain if this really is the case, although the evidence is pretty plausible. It's not our job here to make a judgment one way or the other. But we can leave you with a tantalizing description of what a Nineveh version of these gardens may have looked like. Imagine an artificial hill built of stone colonnades rising in tiers 25 meters into the sky. On top of each colonnade, trees and flowers grow in abundance, seemingly defying gravity. Down the sides, clear streams of water trickle, brought in fresh on a giant aqueduct, then raised up from a reservoir by bronze cast Archimedes screws. Among the terraces walk the rich and powerful of Nineveh, relaxing in the shade of the colonnades, looking up in wonder at the plants that seem to hang in the sky. And at the center of it all stands the man who built this thing to be seen. Not Nebuchadnezzar II, but Sennacherib. And as he watches the subjects admiring his handiwork, the old king allows himself the faintest of smiles. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Please do check out our fantastic sponsor, CuriosityStream, as well. Link to them below. And thank you for watching.